Right, hey guys, how are we doing? Back another video from Mother's Basement. We got another ones to watch for in a new season of anime. Exciting times. Uh, I am excited to check this out because for me, this season is all about sequels. So that time I was reincarnated as a slime, good comeback. Mashoko Tensei, good comeback. Konosuba's got a season three. I'm sure there's something else. Um, but I am enjoying Gogo Loser Ranger. I thought that opening episode was fantastic. Kaiju number eight, I haven't watched yet, but that is going to be my patron uh, reactions for the season, along with Dragon Ball. And yeah, I don't know what else to potentially check out this season, so I'm hoping Jeff here is going to lay it down with the ones to watch for spring 2024. Let's get into it. Oh. Those darn jerks in the anime industry are at it once again, yeah. putting out banger after banger with absolutely no regard for the fact that Yazzie and I just moved and we're exhausted. I mean, those assholes. And My Hero Academia is just recapping everything. I, I went into it being all excited, like, yeah, I caught up last season, cool, and now it's just recaps. And then they're going, oh, season doesn't actually start until May. <sighs> the return in series alone got me feeling like a Jujutsu jumping thing. And Demon Slayer you know, soon. Jumps well. coming in on one side Ooh. with the devastating one two punch of Demon Slayer and Hiroaka. Meanwhile, Kato Kawa's practically air juggling us with Konosuba, yes. Mushoku Tensei, yes. Day Day Live, and synonyms for outliers at both the Demon King Academy oh, yeah, right. and Magic High School. How is that still going, man? And as if that weren't enough, there's also new seasons of Sound Euphonium, Reincarnation. As a yes. slime, the Duke of Death and his maid, and Black Butler, plus Yuru Camp, which is supposed to be relaxing. And there's a live action Odd Taxi spin off out that fing No way. Really? Slaps way harder than I expected. When's a guy supposed huh. to sleep off his jet lag? Now, maybe this all sounds like it's just a me problem since I'm in the very lucky position of watching anime for a living, but mm. believe me, this affects you just as much. Because on top of all those great sequels, I watched almost 40 new anime in the last two weeks. And wow, cool. And out of those, I guarantee that you personally are missing out on at least one life-changing banger. But don't you worry. Yo, go, go, lose Ranger. That open episode was sick. I'm here to help with a list of the 10 new anime that are most worth your time. Cool. These are the ones to watch for spring 2024. Speaking of adventures with adorable transforming fantasy girls, one of the season's best new anime is more. also one of its best old ones. Yeah, Giggle mentioned this in the, uh, when he's checking the trailers out. And one of you mentioned that it's okay to check it out because it's all, it's, it's, it's a, like a reboot but it's and, it's and a sequel, technically. Spice and Wolf, Merchant Meets the Wise Wolf, is a new adaptation of the classic fantasy adventure slash medieval economics lecture of the same name from the same director who gave us the old adaptation. That's Promising cool. to finally finish Isuna Hasakura's incredible story after he left fans hanging for 15 long years. You might wonder what the point is of remaking the old anime instead of just picking up where it left off, especially with many of the same key talents attached to the project, but there are actually several good reasons to do it. First, the original anime skipped over a seemingly unimportant arc that turned out to be completely essential to the series endgame, so they had to at least redo that. And Oh, so it's like, crap, let's go back and cover that, and then we can get to, uh, to an ending. Wow. Second, if you're going to contract Studio Passione to make an anime, you may as well give him Holo at her nakedest. Plus, third, it gives Kevin Penkin a chance to rescore the entire OST. Oh, that doesn't sound nice. That sounds great. Yeah, that's the good shit. God this damn. whole anime actually, and even if it's good shit you've seen before, it does enough new shit with the source material while hewing much closer to the plot and art style of the books that I think it's worth going back to experience it all again. And if you've never seen it before, well, there's a reason old school anime fans haven't shut up about that unfinished masterpiece for a decade and right. a half now. Never watched it myself, never watched Bison Wolf. <laughs> Watch 
Following Lawrence, the crafty merchant, and Hollow, the wise wolf goddess, on their journey from sun soaked wheat fields to the frigid north, you'll be treated to some of the most thorough and immersive low fantasy world building in anime. Looks and nice. you'll meet some of the best realized characters in any medium along the way. The original Spice and Wolves, one of the first things I'd recommend to anyone left wanting hmm. after the last episode of Free Run Beyond Journey's End, so this remake really couldn't have come at a more perfect time, especially given how relatively light this season is on new conventional fantasy anime. Though there is a delightfully unconventional one you ought to keep What's your this? eyes on. Train to the End of the World the is a surreal rail-based odyssey across Control. a post-apocalyptic okay. Japan ravaged by the effects of 7G wireless. What? A bleeding edge experimental cellular network capable of instantly transmitting data directly from the human brain across any distance, which may have ever so slightly broken the local laws of physics. No. As a result, train stations that were once minutes apart are now separated by days of dangerous travel across strange, transformed terrain. And the people oh, at those right, stations okay. have likewise been changed in various unpredictable ways, like the people of Agano, Saitama, who are all turning into animals after they turn 21. Before they no wonder everyone went crazy about the 5G up upgrade. Jesus Christ, we're only 2Gs away from world devastation. They meet that fate. <laughs> the last four girls in the village set out on a long journey to find their missing friend, last seen in Ikebukuro at the other end of the line, with minimal guidance from a disgruntled train conductor <laughs> who can teach them how to work the train, but can't actually come with them because reasons. Right. <laughs> No, that can't be the... No, he's, he's edited that in. Born from the same brilliant writer-director pairing that gave us Shiro Bako and the magnificent Kotobuki, Train to the End of the World is a show brimming with heart, charm, and wit. Not to mention some breathtakingly surreal animation. This right here is what Sakuga nerds like me that looks really live cool. for. And that's not the only gorgeously animated original show we have to get excited for this season. Astronaut comes to us from director Shinji Takamatsu, the comedy legend behind classics like School Rumble, Grand Blue, Nietzsche Bros, cool. Haven't You Heard I'm Sakamoto, <laughs> and the first hundred episodes of Gintama. Wow, this new an anime I still need to get into. The show is a throwback to even classicer classics that feels like it fell out of a time portal from the 80s. Harkening back to the classic Rumiko Takahashi rom-com, Maison Ikoku, the series follows a down-on-his-luck gourmet chef who ends up working a wee bit below his pay grade mm. as the live-in breakfast bar cook at a cheap sharehouse dormitory occupied exclusively by mildly insane weirdos, such as an right. alcoholic indie idol and the world's most deadbeat dad. <laughs> It's not all bad, though, well. <laughs> since Takumi happens to be down bad for the dorm's mysterious young landlady, Mira, and the job presents a perfect excuse to get closer to her. Though as he does, he quickly finds more than he bargained for. See, much like Meizani Koku's Kyoko, Mira has been left all alone in the world as a widow, or Mibojin as a Japanese person, or Nihonjin would put it, which I normally wouldn't bother to explain, except in this case, it's the root of a rather plot-essential pun. She's actually an alien from the planet Mibo, specifically their eggs. Oh yeah, the trailer looked really weird for this. You got the dog and everything as well, all right, okay. Yeah. Princess which Tatsuki overhears her discussing with her talking alien poodle companion, leading to a series of hilarious misunderstandings. So, yeah, some of the humor here might feel a touch 
alienating to anyone ha ha. not familiar with Japanese culture or the classic anime astronauts throwing back to. But the core premise of a house full of eccentric personalities bouncing off each other and the walls is basically universal, and few animated comedies execute on it with this much personality and visual panache. Hmm. Especially when it goes all in on that 80s anime vibe. Cool. Astronauts. Was that not enough explosions for you? Well, Kaiju number eight. I think what I'm going to do for the Patreon, because I've not done episode one yet, is do episode one and two together. Because I was away over the weekend and I was, but yeah, yeah. That's what Shonen Jump anime is for. Plus, I've read the manga as well, so I think it'd be an interesting reaction because I know what's happening. It'd be really cool to see how they animate it and how they go about certain bits and bobs. So, yeah, I love the manga for Kaiju number eight. It's boss. There's nine volumes out at the moment now so yeah. oh go go no this is casual right yeah costumes look similar to the uh the baddies in go go lose ring mate Kaiju Number 8 is yes. set in a world beset by so many giant monster attacks that Japan started numbering the scariest ones like they do with typhoons. A world where only the brave soldiers of the Kaiju Defense Force, armed with weapons made of reclaimed monster bits, stand between the people and certain doom. So cool, man. And then this guy. <laughs> Our hero, Kafka Hibino, is not one of those soldiers. I love this whole... Like, the concept is great, though. Like, he, he, he's the part of the cleanup crew originally. And then this, what I also like about it is that normally your main character is, like, some young guy, you know, like, teenager, maybe early, tw like, 20s at max. This guy's, like, in his 30s and is like, I need a do-over. And then he gets his do-over. But he does clean up after them, which honestly might take even more bravery. I know I'd rather fight a giant monster than go through that shit. Yeah. Literally. Kafka would too, but he gave up on that dream long ago after failing the exam multiple years in a row, and with it his monster slaying badass of a childhood Best friend, friend yeah. whom he once promised he'd always stick by her side. When a newbie with monster killing dreams of his own joins the kaiju cleanup crew though, and they end up saving each other from a smaller giant monster attack, Kafka finds his dreams unexpectedly reignited, only to have them immediately immediately snuffed out again when he's turned into, into a, a kaiju, kaiju himself yeah. by some sort of mini monster parasite thing. Still, he does have his wits about him even- That looks so good, wow. And after transforming, so even as the defense force begins hunting him down, even as he's pitted against the woman he loves, he vows to use his newfound strength to protect the people of Japan in his own way. From the shadows as the newly Yo. identified kaiju number eight. Oh, that's why they call it that. I've been following yes. the original <laughs> manga since it started, so I yeah. can attest this is a beautiful story about how people inspire each other to do that's incredible true. things. But now, thanks to director Shigeyuki Miya and production IG, we've got an anime even more beautiful than that to enjoy, cool. which somehow manages to feel every bit as cinematic as the classic films that inspired it. Go, go, loser rain. This is great. This is gr The first episode was boss. Sure is an explosive. It's such a good idea as well. Explosive send up of the other side of tokusatsu, Sentai, that also casts a monster in the leading role, though not one of the big ones this time. Combatant D, as his name suggests, is one of the nameless skeleton-suited goons that shows up alongside each Power Rangers villain of the week to get kicked around and blown up until enough ad breaks have passed to justify forming the Megazord. It's not exactly a dignified gig, even compared to cleaning up kaiju The animation and on this, where he transforms into a person, is so nearly cool. Nearly a thousand fruitless fights against a ranger squad that killed all their alien invader bosses over a decade ago, but kept the goons around because Monster of the Week battles are big money, money makers. Yeah. He is downright fed up. Hey, 
俺たちが正義だ So he hatches a daring plan to infiltrate the Ranger Force and steal one of their super weapons in hopes it might finally give his faceless friends a fighting chance. With a wonderfully creative hook and seriously impressive animation, both in the fights good, and、though. the laid back comedic beats, where even the anonymous mooks are given memorable personalities through how they move and act, this show is a powerful love letter to the Power Rangers that most Power Rangers. Rangers fans won't even know exists because it's stuck on Hulu and Disney Plus, and they don't advertise their anime at all. Which is honestly even more、Terrible. disgraceful than what those bully Rangers do to these poor goons. So please do your part and watch them suffer for our enjoyment. While we're on the subject of Japan's national pastimes, Ooh, there's this baseball anime that. No, don't skip to the next section. I'll keep this、Blah. short, and <laughs> I promise Oblivion Battery is worth your time. Oblivion Battery. I mean,、battery. Mappa clearly thinks it's worth their animators' time. Just look at that Sakuga yeah, cinematography. And once you get to know the story and characters, it's clear that's not just because baseball is. Bigger than God over here. The series plays with tired sports anime tropes in surprisingly clever ways. Surprising in part because those ways involve yet another tired trope: amnesia. Cannon armed pitcher Haruka Kiyomine and his best bud Kei Kaname were once the most feared battery in middle school baseball,、hmm. until a traumatic head injury knocked all the strategy and、oh. discipline out of the star catcher's noggin, along with all his memories of their friendship and. Baseball in general.、No. Once the brains of the operation, Kay's now reverted to his childish class clown ways. Though at least his brilliant wit still shines through in his sense of humor. <laughs> This anime's comedic timing is seriously impressive, enhanced greatly by all that great animation and a stellar voice cast. Your ears do not deceive you. That was indeed Mamoru Miyano screaming about nipples just now. And as the former superstars go through the beautifully rendered motions of reclaiming their lost mojo and building up their very normal public schools club full of random baseball enthusiasts into an improbably heavy-hitting team, it manages to bring the hype and the laughs in equal measure. If you enjoy baseball, sports anime, or just comedies in general, this one's definitely worth keeping your eye on. Speaking of living Japanese legends like Miyano, also I kind of wish I made a Shohei Otani joke in that last section, but we have to move on. Tonori no Yokai-san imagines what life in modern Japan might look like if figures of folklore like yokai and the kami mingled among us mortals.、Okay. It's not the first anime to tackle such a premise, but any show that invites comparisons to Natsume's Book of Friends is welcome on my watch list. And this series does plenty to set itself apart. This is a slice of life anime in the truest sense of the term, interweaving vignettes of various characters' mundane. Day-to-day -day problems, like a half Kappa girl struggling with both her first crush and the fact that blushing makes her head water boil, to paint in pieces a much bigger <laughs> picture of its mystical small town setting. Whoa. Whoa. One minute we're following a newborn Bakeneko, a cat spirit, as he and his family acclimate to life with a magic talking pet and deal with all the government paperwork you got to do when a new sentient creature suddenly comes into existence. Oh, okay. The next we see the world through the eyes of a spiritually sensitive young lady stuck wishing her missing dad was dead because that would mean he could at least come visit with Grandpa's ghost. In oh, okay. That's a weird way. Of Look, Instead、okay. of potentially being lost forever in the void between worlds, 
So it's a mostly cozy setting, but with a distinct sense of darkness lurking mm. at the edges. Exactly the sort of tone that you want to strike to make a contemporary magic setting feel tangibly real. Though ultimately, the story's focus is less on world building and more on using the concept of yokai to demonstrate that while everyone around you is different, we're all going through it in our own unique ways, which I think we all need a reminder of from yeah. time to time. If you're looking for a fantasy series rooted in Japanese mythology that is about the world building, though, I highly recommend Yatagarasu, The, the Raven, Raven Does, does not, not Choose Its, its master. master, a rich fantasy epic built around politics and palace intrigue that, much like Spice and Wolf for Freerun fans, comes just in time to fill the void left by the Apothecary Diary. Which I would like to take a moment right now to formally apologize for sleeping on last fall. Mau Mau really deserved better. But I have learned from my mistakes. These sorts of stories are always slow burners that need at least a couple episodes to properly evaluate. And with two episodes of Yatagarasu out, I'm happy to report that it looks very promising indeed. The story jumps between a lot of different perspectives to show us various sides of a heated succession conflict that threatens to tear its kingdom of magic transforming crow people apart. Founded eons ago by an ancient god who chose a golden raven to rule over his mountainous land in his stead, the eldest royal son of each generation since has inherited inherited the title of Golden Raven upon choosing his bride from one of four branch families. Okay. But this generation's a little different, because while everyone expected the clever and competent first prince to take over from his father, the second prince, son of a mere courtesan, is an actual honest to Kamisama Golden, Golden Raven. Raven. The first seen in countless wow. years which the kingdom's priests have taken as divine proof of his right to rule brash and unconventional in contrast to the brother who was groomed for the throne, mm. the second prince is seen by many nobles as a threat to their entrenched power. This does sound interesting. Power struggles within families. Ah, Game of Thrones. And the way the story's framed seems to confirm those fears. See, in a clever subversion of expectations, we don't actually meet the princely protagonist until the end of episode two. Instead, we're introduced to the world through the eyes of one of his potential brides-to-be, a naive second daughter to the least powerful branch house thrust unprepared into the tea party battleground of the bridal right when her elder sister is unexpectedly incapacitated. And that's followed by an episode following the prince's future retainer, the second son of a minor warrior clan from the countryside who falls into the role mostly by accident after embarrassing the rude court raven who was supposed to take it. All over the kingdom, we see lines of succession being thrown out of whack, seemingly by the forces of fate. To what end remains to be seen. But for anyone who loves fraught fantasy politics, the journey there should be thorough exciting. Of course, not every anime fan finds that sort of thing exciting, but for the rest of you, What's there's this? always Windbreaker. Windbreaker. Whoa. Oof. Yo! Go ahead. No, I know some of you are gonna- Although I don't know why he's fighting them, so he could be the one in the wrong right now, but- <laughs> uh, Look at that title, which is not the name of the jacket, that's always a compound word, and start snickering uncontrollably. I know that because it's what I did. It is a very unintentionally funny name, especially with the faces they're making on the poster. But as you just saw in that <laughs> kick-ass ass-kicking scene, this is not a shonen anime about dudes blasting each other with hyper farts or whatever. Okay. It somehow has an even more brilliant premise. Everyone loves a good old-fashioned delinquent with a heart of gold. Yes. You know, that one mean-looking kid who will beat up anyone. Anyone who threatens his friends, that is. Yes. Well, with <laughs> Joey Wheeler there. <laughs> Windbreaker isn't just about one delinquent with a heart of gold. It's about a whole school full of them going around beating up a whole town full of regular delinquents. We got big burly delinquents with hearts of gold, small sassy delinquents with hearts of gold, cool. and at the heart of the story, a friggin' tsundere delinquent with a heart <gasps> no. of gold. No. 
Which is the best idea you've ever heard for a character. Don't lie, you know I'm right. Windbreaker is just effortlessly fun. Cool. It had me hooked from the word go. Though, there is one more anime this season that grabbed me even harder. Jellyfish Can't Swim in the Night is a high dive exclusive, which I know makes it a hard sell for a lot of you out there, but you gotta trust me, this one is worth subbing for all by itself, mm. even more so than Oshinoko. I have not seen an original anime that made me feel this specific kind of way since A Place Further Than the Universe. Wow, and he really loved that one. I still haven't watched that. That was that, that's still on my Crunchyroll watch list at the bottom there. Like, I, I'm... And in case you didn't listen to me or Gigak or Arcata when we well, anyone. were all yelling about it five to six years ago, that's a very good thing. Quite possibly the best thing. Like Yorimoi, <laughs> Jellyfish follows a four-person girl squad of diverse personalities and talents as they come together, become best friends, and help each other reach their seemingly impossible dreams. Though, instead of battling the elements to reach Antarctica, in this one they're fighting in the streets of Shibuya to make it as independent artists. Mahiru Kozuki was once a promising young illustrator, but she put the pen down forever after hearing her friends rip on one of her pieces. Of Aww. Painting of a jellyfish that won a contest to become a mural in Shibuya, destroying all her self-confidence in the process. In contrast, Kano Yamanochi already tasted success once as an idol, but she fell out of favor with that notoriously fickle fanbase after getting caught up in a scandal. Instead of giving up, though, she vowed to win those fans back with the power of her music alone, and now performs anonymously as the YouTube indie singer, Jelly, cool. so named for one of her favorite works of art. A certain oh. mural that's always inspired her, and I probably don't have to tell you where the anime is going with That's it. nice. Aw, love it. With that. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> that right there oh. was the moment I knew this would be one of my favorite anime That's of lovely. all time. The music, the animation, the cinematic storyboarding, the acting and art direction, it all came together to just sweep me right off my feet. And that effect is going to be diminished by how we've had to edit it down in this video. But I promise you, if you give the actual show a chance, it will do the same for you. If it can keep up this level of quality and... It's a Dogakobo original, so it almost certainly will. This anime will be talked about by people in the know for years to come. And this is your chance to get in on the ground floor and say you love Jelly before they were cool. Do not miss it. But before you go, don't miss out on all the great stuff we have left in the bargain bin either. First up, Mission Yozakura Family okay. is another big new Shonen Jump adaptation that just barely missed making this list. It's an incredibly touching spy fiction story about overcoming loss and grief and finding Excuse family me. in a different way from adopting adorable Ooh. peanut gremlins, to be clear. But much like last year's Mashal, it suffers from a slightly underwhelming adaptation that makes me want to recommend the original manga mm. over this anime version version. Though that said, it is also stuck on Hulu and Disney Plus, so it does absolutely need all the love it can get from any anime fans interested in watching it. And so does The Fable, a show about a legendary Yakuza hitman who's forced into hiding for a year after his kill count gets a little too impressive for the local police. Oh. Laying low in Okinawa with his handler posing as his sister, the genius killer must face his greatest challenge yet, blending into normal society. 
It's a great premise, though this being a Tezuka Productions anime, it's one that once again is a lot better in manga form. To give you some idea just how bad Disney is at promoting these things, I've seen more anime fans talking about our next bargain bin entry, Girls Band, Girls Cry, Band Cry, than both of those combined, and it's not even legally available in English. What? The subtitles that I am able to read are also unreliable at best, so I can't really speak. This animation's a bit weird, because it's like, normally see, it's got that little CG jank. It looks good, but it's got that moment where it's just like, ah. ...to just how good its story is, though it's probably great considering who wrote it, but thankfully the impact... It's reminding me of like, it's not quite Ruby esque either. It's a bit in between. ...impeccably expressive quality of its 3D yes. animation it's speaks for itself. Weird. It'd I be like a it. real shame if this show never gets officially picked up. I really like that style. Because these visuals deserve to be seen. Oh, it's good. <gasps> Speaking of shows that aren't legally available in English yet, Blue Archive the animation isn't quite that beautiful, but it is surprisingly good for an anime based on a Korean mobile game. Right. Definitely worth watching if you're a fan. And speaking of Korean things, webtoon adaptation Viral Hit tells the story of a kid who gets bullied by his school's resident YouTube celebs until he decides to fight back oh. on and with a channel of his own after a series of improbable coincidences leads to him live streaming a fist fight from his living room, which ends up going viral. Like Yo. the pun in the title, this one's story is more than a little convoluted and pretty darn silly, but it's strangely compelling nonetheless. Interesting. Same goes for reincarnated as an aristocrat, I'll use my appraisal power to rise in the world. Mm. A is Nobunaga's ambition-type video gamey isekai about an aristocrat kid who uses his ability to see other people's stats to surround himself with powerful allies and ultimately, you know, rise in the world. Honestly, it's kind of refreshing seeing a Kirito focus on making other people stronger instead of himself, though it's also kind of weird seeing grown adults take tactical advice from a literal three-year-old, right. no matter how eloquent that three-year-old is. While we're talking isekai, fans of that sort of thing who aren't put off by anime bullshit should also check out Re-Monster, a story about a cannibal psychic from Earth with the power to steal powers who gets unexpectedly reincarnated as a goblin, like that kind of goblin, though he does reform their society as soon as he takes over, then slowly builds an empire out of it in a manner reminiscent of reincarnated as a slime. Mm. Though Remonster's light novel did actually come first, lest anyone out there wrongly write it off as a ripoff. No one could make that mistake about a salad, a salad bowl, of bowl of eccentrics, though. This charmingly original reverse isekai from the creator of Haganai follows a magical princess who gets stuck in our world after a peasant revolt, then gets really into Detective Conan and decides to use her oh, magic yeah. powers to help the sleazy this does look good. This does look cool. private eye she's crashing with become an actual crime-solving super sleuth. It's a very fun show that doubles as a great tourism ad for Gifu Prefecture. If you're looking for fantasy without any portals involved, though, there are also two pretty good ones of those this season. Both of them romances, by a weird coincidence. The Archdemon's Dilemma, How to Love Your Elf Bride, follows a shut-in sorcerer who falls in love at first sight with a slave at a magical auction and vows to free her in hopes she might one day love him back, though he does keep accidentally coming off as unfathomably evil in front of her because he's very socially awkward. Unnamed Memory, meanwhile, is about a fantasy prince who delves into a magic dungeon looking to cure a curse that threatens to kill any woman he marries, only to oh, fall yeah. for the ancient witch who well. was supposed to do the curing and ask her to marry him instead. They're both really cute shows with great character chemistry and surprisingly good humor, plus deceptively deep world building. You really can't go wrong with either one. Unless you prefer your romances more down to earth, of course, though we do also got you covered there in every possible category. For Yuri lovers, there's Whisper Me a Love Song, 
a cute little story about an excitable high school freshman and her cool singer-songwriter senpai that does appear to actually be going somewhere, though it does also put some Nozaki-kun bullshit breaks on the first episode's confession scene yeah. to make sure it gets there slowly. Yeah, Yaoi there fans are eating even better this season with Tadaima Okairi, yeah. a very cute domestic romance about two married men raising their adorable, precocious baby, which one of them actually gave birth to, because I forgot to mention. This one's an Omegaverse anime, but don't let that scare you off. It doesn't. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Giga did the whole like explaining the Omegaverse thing. And stop weird. it from being surprisingly adorable and wholesome. Hi. That's also how I'd describe the season's obligatory harem anime, Studio Apartment, Nice Lighting. Angel included, a show about a guy who has an angel crash land on his porch one night oh. and invites her to live with him after confirming she's not just a crazy person. Then more cute girls show up. Yay. It's not a particularly revolutionary formula as harems go, but let's be honest, that's never bothered us harem fans before. No. Last, but certainly not Bartender. least in the bin, is Bartender Glass of God, a re-adaptation of the classic seinen manga Bartender that, like the new Spice and Wolf, hews a little bit closer to the source material than the original. The series, as you might expect, is about- I hate that he uses that kind of shaker, though. The, if, with that, it should just be the double- Mm. A bartender. I've been a bartender. Be the best one. <laughs> I've made cocktails in Tokyo. Who's able to identify the exact drink his customers need exactly Quattro, when vodka, they need love them. It. Oh. If you're looking for a mature philosophical anime about adults with adult problems, and Spice and Wolf isn't quite filling that quota for you. Well, let's just say they remade this one almost 20 years later for a very good reason. Hmm. Okay, whew, that was a lot of anime. I hope... Might do a reaction to Bartender. Maybe the first episode. Just to maybe critique it. Or maybe not. If you enjoy at least some of it, here's the list again. In case you need a recap. We got Spice Wolf. Trains the end of the world, astronaut, kaiju number eight, go go loser, ranger, oblivion battery, ta da 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 yeah, windbreaker, jellyfish comes with the night. All right, cool. I'm Jeff Thu, professional insert relevant joke. Don't forget to write a joke, Jeff. And I'm gonna go pass out now. Bye. Just go sleep, my friend. Go sleep and enjoy yourself. Very cool. Awesome. So there's there's some interesting ones. I, I still think though that like I'm just gonna stick with the sequels that I'm watching. Uh, Go Go Loser Go Go Loser Ranger will be one that I will be watching every week as a personal like enjoyment as well. Kaiju number eight. Like I said, I will be reacting to that on the Patreon page. Uh, so if you want to see those, go check that out. And then we've got Mashuka Tensei, Talents Reincarnated kind of Slime, Konosuba. Like it's crazy. But um, anyway. Thank you to my patrons. If you want to have your name at the end of every video or want to watch patron-only reactions, such as the original Dragon Ball series, and potentially, well, it's going to happen, Kaiju number 8, link in the description to the Patreon page. One dollar a month is all I ask to help support channels. Great patrons, thank you for that. And thank you all for watching. You guys think of that. You guys think of this. Click like, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave comments down below. Let me know what I should watch and discuss in future videos. And I'll see you guys all, you guys, next time.